What doesn't? This is an amazing uh, group of musicians. I, I had the good fortune, I think a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, to work with the orchestra for the first time. And as with so many of our amazing British orchestras, uh, the first thing that strikes you is their ability to read music in a rehearsal. The sight reading, as we put it, is, is phenomenal with this orchestra. So as a conductor, that's already a dream. You, you move your hands in a subtle way, or you lift an eyebrow, or you lean back slightly, or you any gesture uh, receives a response in the sound from the orchestra. So that's already a, a dream. Um, but the other thing that excites me greatly, and I think every conductor that works with this orchestra, is not only that responsiveness to gesture, but also the interest that the orchestra has in rehearsing. So we'll play a passage, stop, and then I may ask for a couple of things or we may talk about a, a way of playing something. And you see that the orchestra not only gets it, but they want to find colors and sounds. Um, and that's an amazing combination to have that, to have the responsiveness to gesture, the, the incredibly high basic level of orchestral playing that this orchestra has, but then also a thirst for more. So it's, it's incredibly rewarding for someone like me. What's very interesting is a comparison between uh, the UK and Germany, for example. So the, the, the method with which an orchestra works, the way they rehearse, the way they sight read, is different. Um, even with the very top level of uh, German orchestras, I would say, I don't think they would be insulted if I were to say that their sight reading in, in the first rehearsal is of a slightly lower level, so it's not as perfect in the first rehearsals. Um, but for that, they generally have at least one or two rehearsals more per production. Now, it's one of the interesting things in my life. I mean, I, I'm obviously British through and through, but I went over to Germany to study. I, I lived there for eight years in Dusseldorf, studied the cello, studied conducting. And I've been, since then, in Nuremberg as chief conductor for, yeah, seven years. So Germany is a huge part of my musical life. Um, but I, I'm, I'm always weighing this up. We, we have less time for rehearsal here in the UK, but the orchestra have better sight readers. There's, there's a, a sense of urgency and excitement in every rehearsal and every production, which is very productive. It does give uh, a special edge to everything. On the other hand, I'm sure that you know my friends and colleagues in or orchestras here in the UK would wish every now and again for just a little bit more room to breathe, You know, not always that, that tension. And at the same time, in Germany, I often say to the orchestras, guys, if, if we were able to you know, find that, that level of concentration in the first rehearsal, because we only have one or we only have two rehearsals, and, and lift our level of sight reading, and then have two more days of rehearsals like we do, imagine what we could achieve. So um, around the world with orchestras, there's this sliding scale of, of a relationship between the amount of rehearsal you have and the amount of focus. And um, I have to say, for example, in, 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 in Ottawa, we have, we have a great luxury there. The players have that um, sort of British approach to rehearsals. And the first rehearsal is very, very clean or you're very focused at playing. But we also have uh, a fair bit of rehearsal, so I'm lucky there. A position like principal associate conductor is is a, a sort of making official of a relationship with the orchestra. It's, it's saying you know we 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 get on well and and it's something that both sides believe has a a future, and a step towards saying right well let's. Let's do more together. Let's see where this leads us. And um, I do, I feel, I mean, if you look at this, this orchestra's history, not just what they are now, but you look at their history, I feel incredibly privileged. There's such a, a line of astonishing musicians who have been in the orchestra, have conducted the orchestra, and have performed as soloists with the orchestra. It has such a rich tradition of touring, of performing in the UK, that, that I think anybody would feel... Um, yeah, genuinely privileged to have any kind of title with the orchestra, and and I do. But I, you know, I f I, I think it's a little bit like you know, conductors' relationships with orchestras are a little bit like when you you're, you're single and you start dating. You know, you you go out for a dinner with a girl, and it's, it's you know that's nice. I like her. It kind of works. There's a good chemistry, and then you meet the next week and it just kind of develops and then you meet a week later and maybe that one doesn't work and so you say, okay, that's maybe not the right. And then the next time you try, you know, it, it's one of those ones where after every date it feels like, oh, you know, there's, there's something there, there's something there and there's a trust there and a feeling like 
it could be mutually beneficial and mutually interesting. And to be embarking on this phase where we say, hey, should we see each other more regularly, you know, <laughs> is, it is, uh, is really special because the more trust there is between a conductor and an orchestra, the more you can achieve. But of course, just like in a relationship, it's also important to keep the magic there. So uh, that's the greatest challenge for a conductor is to, to not become routine for an orchestra, for you always to be challenging them, to always be interesting for them, um, and to always respect them. I think it will be not, nothing new to hear this, because I think that, that this is the way most musicians work, but my modus operandi is very much to, to try and connect with the essence of every work. So, uh, you know, a conductor's life is an interesting one. We spend an awful amount, of, uh, an awful lot of time sitting at a, a desk, studying scores, and it's, that's a very intimate relationship. You or I, um, you, I do a, a musicological analysis of a piece, so I, I break down its structure, its form, how it's been put together, which is a fascinating part of music. You know, it's like a, a Shakespeare play. You can, you can just hear the words and not really think about the form or the structure. But then you can look at iambic pentameter and you can realize, okay, wow, he didn't just write this story, which is incredible in itself. He decided to shackle himself with iambic pentameter. And the more you understand those little forms, like iambic pentameter, and it gives equivalent, we have equivalent in, in music, the more you start to see where he breaks the shackles. You know? And so that's an important part of my work, is understanding the craftsmanship in a, in a piece, let's say a symphony. Um, but you have to do that early enough that that becomes innate. Uh, you understand it. If someone asks you about it, you could talk about it. But you have to then start to see the forest for the trees. You, know, you have to take a step back and say, right, that was the craftsmanship part. But what was Beethoven or Shostakovich or Brahms? What, what were they actually trying to express with this music? If they were trying to express anything concrete at all. Um, and, and to be in that place then when you stand in front of the orchestra. So if there's a moment where you need to talk in detail, you can always come back to that analysis you've done. But basically it's to try and find that thread. Because I think that's what um, speaks very strongly to, to the audience. And we can't forget that's what we're there for. We're there as a conduit for the music that was conceived of by these incredible men and women over the centuries. Uh, we're there as a conduit to, to present it to the people listening to it. Um, and unless you're in that place, unless you're in that zone, uh, it's very hard to, to do that honestly. And, and so I'd say that if I, if I aim for anything in concert, it's to be in the right place for each piece, it's to be the right, right representative of each piece, and to, to bring the orchestra with me. My mother is a, was a concert pianist too. She, she's yes. re retired from playing, but, and, and my, my grandmother was a cellist and her father was an organist. There's an awful long line of, uh, of music in the family. But maybe because of that, um, my parents were always a pains to keep every door open for me and that I kept every door open for myself. So I did a lot of sport when I was young. I did a lot of school, and they sent me to a very serious school, which was very academic rather than very musical, although I have to add... It was an academic school, but I was given enormous opportunities. You know, I was allowed to conduct the school orchestra there. I played cello concertos with the orchestra. Um, but, but I think they, what they said to me is, is very true of any profession that, that's like music, or indeed any profession. They said, you only go that route if that is absolutely all you want to do, you know, if that's your absolute passion. Because as with sport or as with any very intense academic subjects. Music is one of those things that, in order to wake up every day and, and have the, the drive to, to study and get better and, and improve, you, you, it needs to be the love of your life. Um, and if you have good fortune then on top of that, you know, on top of the hard work to, to, to build a career, then, then it becomes in a sense easier. The stresses are different ones, but, but you, you feel the reward of that hard work. What is such a challenge for any young person going into music, just as with actors, is that there's a very good chance, even if you're great, and even if you work very hard, that you won't have a lot of concerts, that you won't be on stage very much. much. And it becomes somewhat of a vicious circle. The less you perform, the more challenging every performance becomes, you know, the more of a, a hurdle. Um, you know, my parents were, were acutely aware of that and wanted to just be sure that if I went this route, it was because it was my decision and nothing that had been forced on me. Um, and I'm very grateful for that.